Hey, <laughs> hey come on about the, the, the last part of that. Good morning, TCIP. Is it good to be here today? We got a little, little cool, a little rainy. It's an awesome day outside. It's good and warm in here. Guys, we're here to praise Jesus today. Amen? Amen. Come on, we're going to warm you up. We got coffee. We're ready to go. We're going to get everybody fired up. The band's ready to go, guys. It's going to be an exciting time here at the church in Peaster. All right, next week is baptism. It's our fifth Sunday, No Children's Church. I need everybody's names today that we, we'll get everything set up for next uh, next Sunday. Our fifth Sunday baptism is coming up. Guys, we've got a lot of things coming up in May and June and July. You need to stay connected to your church. You text TCIP Connect to 94000, and you'll get an email and a text. You'll What's going on? We won't have to do it up the announcements, but you'll just get your text on Friday, and you'll see everything that's going on in our church. Amen? Amen. Oh, we ready to praise God? Yes. Well, let's stand up and let's get a little bit excited about it. I'm going to try it one more time. Are we ready to praise Jesus? All right, here we go. Our Father God, we want to praise you and thank you and love on you because of who you are and what you've done that we cannot do for ourselves. We thank you. You sent your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our sacrifice for sin. You did what we could not do. We could not fulfill the law. Sin dwells in our bodies, and we, we fail to fail many times, Lord. But we want to thank you that you are the answer. Jesus is the answer. Holy Spirit, come upon us today that we might worship Jesus in spirit and in truth, that we might sing praises from our hearts. And, uh, and Lord, for those that, ha that are burdened down with sin and, and with uh, circumstances, I pray, O oh God, that you would help them to lift up their eyes beyond that into your faith. We are in your presence because Jesus has risen in our hearts. And so we thank you. We praise you. Meet all of our needs now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, team. Praise team. Are y'all ready? Woo! Is there joy amongst you? Woo! All right, let's go.
morning, CCIP. Thank you all for being here this morning to worship with us. Before we worship one last time, let's pray and just open up our hearts, our minds to offer and to be ready for the word of the Lord. Most holy God, Savior, and Comforter, may our giving today reflect the trust we have as a church in you. May today be a day of peace, joy, and unity as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Please receive our offering, Father, with our deepest humility and trust in you. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, amen. Jesus. 
exist over you in your hurting in your sorrow i will ask my god to move i speak the name because it's all that i can do in desperation i'll seek heaven and pray this for you i pray for your healing that circumstances would change i pray that the fear inside would flee in jesus name i pray that a breakthrough would happen today i pray miracles over your life in jesus name in jesus name i speak the name of all authority declaring We're happy to be here and praise in Jesus. Yeah. 
Oh, good morning. Good job, guys. I thought we had a little CRD going, but I was wrong. CRD, Caucasian Rhythm Deficiency. Oh, no, we did good. I got to eat a little shimmy shake. Yeah. Man, that was good. Man, mm, man I'm ready to go. You know, the problem with the series, and, and it was a series that I didn't mean to start, but I have found out in my own life, I've been so enlightened as I've read the Scriptures, especially in Romans and Ephesians, Second Corinthians and Galatians especially. We have started something that it just has to continue, and it's just as it builds in my heart, I'd like to share with you the things that I've discovered about about what our discussion, our title has been over the past, I think this is our third week, of the importance of praise and what you just heard. And let the glory of the Lord rise among us. But who are us? That's a fundamental question that has to be answered. And us, we are a Gentile church. And the original plan of God was that we would be outcasts. We would not be His people. We would not be His nation. That we, on our own, under our own intuition, we would not, we could care less about God. We're Gentiles, the nations, the dogs. God came and sent Jesus, the Messiah, to come to save Israel. But once they rejected him, the door then became open to churches like us who are non-Jewish. Jesus was fully Jewish. Jesus operated in the Jewish religion. He, he fulfilled the prophets and the law. He attended their ceremonies and their temple worship and their sacrifices. Being the ultimate sacrifice himself has his death on the cross proof. But he, but he fully participated in the Jewish religion and his own nation, his God's chose, God the Father's chosen people. Once they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, he then opened it up to us. I can give you no greater news than that. Otherwise, we would still be on the outside, totally excluded from the things of God. Now, as we've been preaching through this, some questions naturally arise as to then, <coughs> excuse me, where do we fit within the law? I'm going to say something stunning. Always remember this, as I've shared before, that I read one. This is not my quote, but I read it someplace one time, and it stuck. And that is, what is a, what is a preacher's uh, purpose in preaching? Well, it's two things, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Now, we're going to do both those things today, okay? But hear me out over the next three weeks or three or four, how, next three years, however long it takes. Because this is one of the most important subjects is how do we, how do we deal with the Jewish law being Gentiles? Because the early church, as we went three weeks ago, said in their first council in the book of Acts, the, the first church was fully Jewish. It wasn't made up of any Gentiles at all. No, nobody like us. It was all Jews who were the first preachers and evangelists of the gospel. And they read Paul, whether it's Paul or Silas or, or it doesn't matter, the, the Peter, they were all, John, they were all Jews. And they saw and received Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God who died for the sins of the world. But something happened, and that is, in the church, more Jews who are of the religious sect called the Pharisees, began to join the Christian church. But they maintained their ideas about the law. This is all in Acts 15, 14 and 15. And an argument arose in the only church in existence, which was the church at Jerusalem at the time. And so the Pharisees, who became believers in Jesus, said this. I'm just trying to catch this up very quickly. I said, they said this, and this is all recorded in the book of Acts. We understand who Jesus is, and we understand his purpose for the Jews. But we're also getting reports that Gentiles, on these missionary journeys of Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Luke and others, we're getting, <coughs> we're getting correspondence <coughs> and reports that the, un the unspeakable is happening. Now, this is all the debate at Jerusalem Church, the only church in existence. They're getting, they're getting information that people like us, non-Jews, are coming to the gospel by the thousands. And they don't know how to do that because in their minds and in their traditional thought, they were thinking only Jews are going to do this, and that can't be right. 
And so the whole purpose is to, so what they, so what, what the Pharisees said who were believers in Jesus, but real, they just had religiosity all over them. They said, okay, we can solve the problem this way. And I've shared this, you know where I'm going, for those of you who haven't been here. They said this, okay, in order to become a Christian, a Gentile has to become a Jew first. And then his Christianity can merge with Judaism and everything will be all right. Then they said this, the only way for a Gentile to become a Jew is through the act of circumcision, which would put them in the covenant of Abraham, who is, you know, the father of the Jewish nation. See the covenant? So in order to become a Christian, you have to become a Jew through circumcision. Then you can become a Christian melded into Jewish philosophy and religion. Well, that was unacceptable to Paul and Silas, especially to the Apostle Paul. He said, you've got to be kidding. He said, we're not even, we're not even good Israelites ourselves. Why would we put this burden on Gentiles who do not know the law of Moses? And then three weeks ago, we started talking about what will the, what will the Gentile church look like? So I'm going to make a stunning statement, and over the next three weeks, you're going to walk away and say, I didn't believe that when he said it. And I even got a little aggravated at him. But I heard him out, and there's no doubt. Because I'm not talking about one or two obscure verses in this. I'm talking about entire books of the Bible that have this issue to deal with. What will the Gentile church look like? Then we went back three weeks ago, and we talked about there is the tabernacle or the law of Moses inside the tabernacle of Moses. And then we're given the prophecy. This is, this is what the council decided. This is what the council decided. James, the pastor of the church in Acts 15, says, okay, in order to solve this problem, I don't think that a Gentile, as us, has to become a Jew first to become a Christian. I don't believe that. So, because of two prophecies, one in Amos and one in Isaiah, and he quotes the prophecies, and it says that in the latter times, in the latter times of the world, of time itself, before, before the world is destroyed, the Gentiles will come in by droves into the kingdom but will come in from all over the world. And you can read all of this in Acts 15. I just don't have time to go there this morning. But they said, and then he says this as a prophecy. He said, you know, there's even a prophecy that we of Israel, we Jews, will operate under the law of Moses, under the tabernacle of Moses. But the tabernacle of David will be restored for the Gentiles. And the tabernacle of David, as we've been over the past couple of weeks, is full of joy and praise and worship of God. No rules and no law. Just praising Jesus for who he is and praising God for who he is. And that brings us up to, and this is that statement. It will surprise you to know and to understand that the law was never given to us. It does not apply. That's a, that's a hard, you, wait, what? No, the, the law was given through Moses to the Jewish nation. Grace and truth were given to us, which is greater. See, they're not, the laws of God are not written on stones, tablets of stone. They are written upon a Gentile's heart. We naturally know why. Because the Holy Spirit is greater than the law. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. See, that's, that's where we get into morals and ethics. Everybody says, we just, you know, I, I see what's going on in the world, and I want them to be as holy as me. We forget who we were before we came into the kingdom. We forget that we were alienated from those type of things. Now, I bring up my own quotes every Sunday morning, but this one's not mine. This was by a guy named Eusebius. Now, maybe you've never heard of Eusebius, but he is called the father of church history. His one volume is called Ecclesiastical History. I was reading Eusebius this week, and I came across this quote. That's not going to make a lot of sense right now. And by the way, Eusebius was born in 260 A.D., so this is 2,000 years old. He was writing church history when nobody else would. A lot of the writings that he uses and quotes, Eusebius uses, are not even in existence anymore. So church scholars today use his writings to say, well, such and such said this back, you know, 2,000 years ago because Eusebius recorded it as being said. But this is what he said 2,000 years ago. Father of church history. He who loves his own household best will be the kindest to them without. He who loves his own household best will be the kindest to them without. 
we as a church are a household. And there's so much meanness in the world that sometimes just in desperation we say, how can you be that way? Why don't you be like me? Why don't you get over your sins? And yet we forget who we were prior to our salvation. So what we're going to do this morning is look at what does, and this is just the beginning. Don't come up and throw a bunch of questions at me. Three weeks you can, four weeks, five years from now you can when I'm done. Matter of fact, I hope to preach this sermon for the rest of my life. That way you won't have any questions for me. But I will challenge you to do one thing before you just say, I'm not buying it. I want you to go home today and read Romans 7 and 8, chapter 7 and 8. It'll change your life if you listen to me this morning, okay? We'll get into that in the next week or two. So we talked about the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. So the question then arises then, and it, it arose back then in this same council, then what good is it to be a Jew? If everybody's going to be led into the party, then what advantage has the Jew over the Gentile as it comes as, as it applies to the kingdom of God? It's a very natural question. Then what's the point of even being Jewish was their response back to Paul's answer. Okay? All right, I'll show you. And then this is what Paul says. Look, please, in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. And actually beginning in verse 1, if we can, I know I only put 2 up there. But if we can go back to verse 1, that sure would be helpful. Because the question in verse 1 is, then what advantage has the Jew over a Gentile? This is what it says right here in verse 2. The advantage is great, Paul says, in every respect. Now what? Here comes verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? See how it all works in the plan? This is a direct response to the question. Then why, 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 why the law? Why being Jewish? If God's going to trick us and let everybody in, then what's the point? Why are we persecuted? This is the answer. What advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. Now we go to verse 2. First of all, that they, they alone, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's what God gave them as the greatest gift. The law and the prophets. And the law says God works this way and operates this way and expects this to be holiness. But he's also going to send a Messiah that is the fulfillment of every prophecy ever getting in this book. The advantage is he could have chosen anybody, but he didn't choose us. He didn't choose the United States. He didn't choose Russia. He didn't choose China. He didn't choose some other. He didn't choose Rome. He chose Jews to keep these books in their heart for the coming Messiah. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God, the Old Testament, as you and I would know them. Now that takes us to, let's go please to Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16. It's going to be a lot of scriptures over the next three or four weeks, so please take note. Now this is to the church at Ephesus, <coughs> like us, non-Jews. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision by the Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant. You knew nothing about Abraham. You knew nothing about Jews. You knew nothing about the priesthood. You knew nothing about the law. Just keep that in mind before you judge others. Just remember who you were before that day that you became a Christian, a born-again person. Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, no law. But now in Christ Jesus, here comes our law, the law of love, the law of grace. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our, not the law. I can't keep the law. Not even going to try. God, God, the Holy Spirit has written something in my heart that I know instinctively, whether it's right or wrong. I don't have to apply it, but I know. I don't have to read any law to tell me that lying is wrong or that cheating is wrong or stealing or adultery. I don't need some law telling me that. I will instinctively know it. For he himself is our peace who made both groups Gentiles and Jews into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the, the, the hatred, the hostility. That's what enmity means, the hostility, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. 
the law is against me. But you say, but all but Brother John, isn't the law good? Oh, that's the problem. We're going to get into that here in about 30 seconds. The law is good. The law of Moses is righteous. The law of Moses is perfect. So what's wrong with it? Nothing. No, they're all absolutely fine. They're fine. We're, we're going to talk about it in just a minute. What's, what's going on here? Okay, just stay with me. So that in himself he might make the two, that's Jews and Gentiles, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the wall of hostility. The church will, can be made up of Jews and Gentiles, whether the Jews receive it or not. It's now been passed on to us to receive the truth or not. And, and that's called the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people together. We are in one body. Now, we're going to get real serious now. I want you to turn, please, to the story of Jesus. I'm just going to hit these real quick this morning because we're going to slow down next week. This is the woman at Sychar, a, a, a non-Jew. A Samaritan woman, a Gentile like us, who meets Jesus at the well of Sychar one day in Samaria. Jesus said to the woman, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain of Gerizim is what he was referring to, which is right there in front of the well of Jacob, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. We know that. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father, not by the law, not by what they think are right or wrong written down on somebody's law, in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now let's define worship. Next, define worship. What does it mean? This is my definition, and I've used it for years. What is true worship? is my heart's response to God's revelation of Himself. My heart's response to what God reveals to me and to you. And we come into church as a Gentile church, and we're thankful that He has revealed light to us and glory to us through His blessed Son, Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua ben Nosa, Jesus of Nazareth, who died for our sins, and who gave us the Holy Spirit to comfort us. We don't need the law for that. It was never meant for us to begin with. Never meant for us to begin with. I want you to turn, please, to John 1, verses 14 through 18. And the Word, the Word, the Logos in Greek, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we saw His glory. And this is so important, especially for next week. Whenever you see the word glory, replace it with the word light. It's the same word in Greek. Wherever you and remember in, at the birth of Jesus, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and the light of the Lord shone round. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, I saw the glory, the light of God behind the curtain, in the, behind the veil of the Ark of the Covenant. It means light. And that's going to become very important to us in just, I think, here in about 10 seconds. But look at where we at, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his light. Light as the only as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Jesus and cried out, saying, This is was he of whom I have said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Now now read. I'm gonna give you a second to read that. Law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, and that's Jesus. Jesus has explained God the Father. See, we have become a, a, a church of law keepers. We can. And we want everybody else to accept our definition of the law, which is Jewish. It wasn't given to us. But the day that you really understand that, but I, there, I, I'm not under the law. It's, the law has been abolished. It's, it's done away with. It's gone in my heart. I don't, not, I don't not lie because I read, Thou shalt not lie. 
Now, before we get into this next couple of verses, I want to give you a story that I've, and I'm, it, it can be taken offensively, but please, that's why I've never shared it. But I've had this illustration in my mind, and I always thought to myself, I will never give that illustration. I'm going to today. And it hit me about 10 years ago when I realized how important this illustration was. But, it's, but I just don't like saying it, but I never have before. But I want to give you an illustration before we read these scriptures of what the law does. Why the law is so condemning. Not that it's right. It's right. It's righteous. It's pure. It's holy. It's written by God himself. Here is, the, here is my illustration. You take a 12-year-old little boy. And it's a beautiful Saturday morning. And that little boy knows, that, and he's 12 years old, and he can ride a bicycle, and he knows that on Saturdays all of his buddies meet at the school. And they're going to, today, they're going to play some basketball. Maybe they're going to, maybe they're going to uh, you know, ride uh, skateboards. Maybe they're going to play a little softball or maybe some frisbee or whatever the case is. They know. And they're going to, especially he's excited to play what we call flies and spinners. Remember that one, old guys? Flies and skinners, and then what you're going to do, we're going to shag some baseball. That's the way um, we're going to shag. We love shagging baseball. It's just 100,000 times of just hitting ball. Well, in, in, in flies and skinners, you get about 40 guys bunched up about 100 yards that way, and one batter standing there by himself hitting uh, flies and, and skinners. Could, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. Can't always hit one right, but... If, you, if you're the guy in that group of 30 or 40 who gets five skinners or grounders or three fly balls caught, they have to be caught, then you're the one that gets to go in and bat. So you're the leader. What, what you guys will remember, that's my age, inside that, inside that pit, it made a mosh pit look like a four or five-star hotel. It was, you could hit them. You could elbow them in the teeth. You could jump on their back. You could tackle them. You could jump up and you could get in with a buddy and say, I'll hit them all to you if you get me. So you'd tackle about three or four. And big pileup would occur. Anything to keep anybody else from catching that fly ball. Everybody walked out bleeding and holding their heads and their teeth gone and ears pulled off. It was nasty in those pits, but it was a blast. My goodness, what fun to be in that group. Especially when it's right up there. And you know one guy that you don't like is just fixing to catch it? He's toast. He's, an, he's a cheap shot. It's a cheap shot. Ever, how many of you guys been there? What a bunch of liars. There you go. I knew, yes. So this 12-year-old boy is going to school that day so excited because he knows he's going to have a blast. But on his way, he sees something flapping in the gutter. And he doesn't know what it is. Now remember, he's 12 years old. He knows nothing. He just wants to have fun. He just wants to live his life. And there it is, flapping in the gutter. Somebody's thrown out a pornographic magazine. He doesn't know. But in curiosity, he gets out and he picks up this pornographic magazine. And for the first time in his life, he sees something that five seconds ago was unimaginable. And what happens to that 12-year-old boy? He begins to, to, to be aroused. He, for the first, in, 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 in the twinkling of an eye, from the time it took him to get off that bicycle on his way to the school, from the time he found that pornographic magazine in the gutter, his life has changed forever. Because now a whole new world has, has entered into his life. And he doesn't understand it. And he doesn't get it because he's too young to understand. He doesn't have the mental or moral capacity to understand it. But he, but he wants to see more. Will he just leave the magazine there? Oh, no, he'll take it home and hide it. See, that's what the law does. If the law is perfect and pure and good and holy and righteous, which it is, and still we can't keep it, and it still arouses in me, see, it still arouses in me lying, and thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, but that will one, or I shall not covet. See, Paul says this, and we'll get there in a minute. I didn't know I coveted until I read in the law that thou shalt not covet. The little boy says, I didn't know anything about pornography until I looked at it. Now I don't know what to do with it except hide it and look at it later. He becomes more interested. Now let me say this. I've always been, un I've always been a little bit confused as why 
politicians don't use this more. Christian politicians use this more in their defense against libraries. Because that child in that school library doesn't know anything about certain issues of the day until he reads it or she reads it in a book and then says, this interests me. It opens their mind to a dark place. All I have to do is change this, look this way, act this way. I didn't know until I read this book that said this is what I'm supposed to be and what I can do with my own life. And all of a sudden, the spiral goes down and down and down. It'll never go up. It always degenerates into evil. That's exactly the point Paul makes in... Let's just go to Luke chapter 2 if we can. I think that's next on the list. Now, this is the day of Jesus' dedication. He's a little baby boy. He's eight days old now. Mary and Joseph now bring him to the, to the temple in Jerusalem from Nazareth or Bethlehem. All right? So Simeon is a priest and a prophet. They bring the baby Jesus to do everything under the law to circumcise the child as the firstborn to, to God. And when Simeon holds that baby, this is what he said. This is what he prophesied. And Simeon came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents, Mary and Joseph, <coughs> brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant, talking about himself, to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have now seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of everybody. If this doesn't give you cold chills, you don't need to be at this church. A light of revelation to the and the glory and the light to your people here. Revelation and light. Revelation to the Jews that their Messiah has come and a revelation of light that we're no longer in darkness and we don't have to be circumcised and we don't have to keep the law and we don't have, because God has done something greater than the law. The law has been abolished in our hearts. And he now doesn't write it on stone of Moses, something that we were ne- was never intended for us. They are the keepers of the oracles. But now he writes with his finger in our hearts through a, through a clear conscience and through his Holy Spirit inviting women in. Now he tells us instinctively, intuitively, whether we're about to step off into sin or want to please him and ignore it and say, I'm I'm not not going there today. I refuse to go there today. Light of revelation, the glory of your people to the Gentiles, and a light of revelation. Now, now we're going to get real serious. Look at that. I'm going to add a little bit to this one too. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, please, if you can. Revelation chapter 3, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. And I think when I wrote my my initial notes, I think I just put down 5 through 6. But let me go ahead and since that was not, there we go, what? This is to the Gentiles. Not that we are adequate in ourselves. Don't think that you can do it yourself without the law. Not that we are adequate, adequate within ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. Okay? Conscience and doing what's right and doing what's wrong. But our adequacy is from God. This is to a Gentile church, not to, it, not, to it, not to the Jews, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not the old. Not of the letter of the law, and that's the, that's the Holy Scripture, but of the Spirit. For the law of Moses, which is right because I can't keep it, it alienates me from God. Jesus said, if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. You say, well, Brother John, I'm pretty good. I've kept them all. What's the first one? Love God with all your heart, mind, body, strength, and soul. Do you? No. I have other interests more important than that. What's the second law, asked Jesus? To love your neighbor as yourself. Do you? And all of a sudden, we find out that we can't even keep the first one, much less the others. So we're lawbreakers. It is right, and it is perfect, and the law is pure and righteous and holy. It is given from God. But we can't keep it. Therefore, when I know that it says not to lie, when I lie, what happens? Condemnation and guilt that I can't get away from. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Because why? He has abolished the law. What? For the letter of the law 
Mosaic law, it kills. It'll kill you. But the Spirit gives life. Now watch what he calls the ministry of the law. But if the ministry of death, in letters engraved on stones, came with glory, light, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was. See, it's a faded out glory. The law was fading because a new law, a law of grace and love, was about to be introduced to the Father. So will the ministry of the Spirit fail. I'm sorry. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with light? Let's read that again. Let's just read that again, if we can. Not that we are adequate in ourselves. In other words, just because we don't have the law means we're a bunch of idiots. We're not adequate within ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not in the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter of the law will kill you, but the Spirit gives life. If the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone came with glory or light, that's not what they're for. So that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face was fading as it was. How will the ministry of the Gentiles, of the Holy Spirit indwelling within your heart, how will that ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Do you see what he's saying? We're not, we're not, well, let's just, let's just keep right on moving forward. Now watch this. I want you to turn for And we're going to be in 7 and 8 over the next few weeks here. Look at Romans 8, 1 through 4. Oh, boy. Oh, goodness. All right. Now, after all he said, just read Romans 7 and 8 tonight and you'll agree. I know where he's going. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was sinful through the flesh, weak through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh. Because we've been taught traditionally really bad teachings about the law. Not here. Not today. If you'll sit through this series, you will be set free by the end of it. Because I have been. I'm telling you. I want you to turn, please, to Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. <laughs> now, again, I'm not just picking some verses. This is the whole chapter. That's why I'm doing this. Because these are the whole chapters concerning this subject. Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law? That's Jews, right? I'm, I'm going to speak to those who know the law, the Jews. That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married, now he uses an example. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, while, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if your husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made to die to the law, die to that husband, through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined and married to another, to Jesus, who was raised from the dead, in order that, why? We might bear fruit for God. That only thing we're bearing anymore is judgment on a very evil world. It's not our place. Our place is to share the gospel. You're not going to change their minds with an argument. You're not going to change their mind. It is not in them to change their mind. They feel as strongly about their humanism as you do about your Christianity. Only the Holy Spirit, only by being an example, can somebody say, what do you know that I don't? In order that we might bear fruit for God, for while we were in the flesh, 
the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. This is Paul talking now. Big boy. You know, Uncle Paul? The law were aroused by the law. We're at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been, say it please, next three words, released forward, released from the law. Having died to that by which we were bound, that's the law, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? And here comes my example of the 12-year-old boy. No! And even in the authorized version, King James Version, it says, God forbid. So is the law wrong? Is it sinful? Is it unrighteous? Is it unholy? Is it mistaken? No! On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, boy, those two words. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, when I read, Thou shalt not covet, sin became alive and I died that day. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. Here we come to that two little words again. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it, it killed me. I lived under so much condiment cost that I thought I was a good Jew. I thought I was a great Pharisee. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. My father was a a Pharisee. My grandfather was a Pharisee. I've done everything according to the law. And all of a sudden, but deep down, see, he knew he coveted. But he could say it's okay because, you know, that can be taken a lot away. Did he want somebody's money? Did he want somebody's life? Did he want somebody's position? Who knows? We're not told. But he coveted down inside his heart, still trying to think. And then one day he he read, Thou shalt not covet. And to all of his arrogance went away. I died. Such guilt. God's telling me, will God ever love me again? I've been such a fool. It killed me. Then the law is the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good and righteous and holy, the law, become a cause of death for me? God forbid that thought. Rather, it was sin. You see, the law is not the problem. It's the Adamic sin in me that's the problem. The law is holy. But by my very nature, I am not. So I can't keep the law, therefore I am condemned. But the law of grace has set us free from the law of condemnation through Christ. Why? Because he fulfilled the law. Such a teaching. It was sin. In order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through what is good, so that the commandment, that through the commandment, sin would become, I hate these last two words, they just break your heart. Utterly sinful. I want you to turn, please. Now, are we in seven right now? Okay, let's go back to seven again. Was that all of it? Okay. Let's turn, please, then to Matthew chapter. We're going to be getting into a lot of this. No, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do it now. We're going to do it now. Because I, I want to bring this out. and Just stay with this series. I know you're being challenged, but stay with it. And again, the best thing you could possibly do before you go to lunch and say, I hate that guy. <coughs> and that happens with whatever I say. But anyway. But you can't say I'm ugly. Say, I don't know about that. Okay. Oh, that's out my life. But I believe the lie. Okay. Please stay with it. It will change your life. Let's finish with this. Let's finish, let's finish in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 15. I'm going to add five more. And I should have called you this morning, and I apologize, Sound Booth. This is not their fault. This is all on me. But I just kept reading and going, I can't leave that out. So you're going to hear all this one. So we're going to give them a minute to go up to 1 through 15, okay? Just keep remembering the illustration of the little boy. And this is going to explain a lot because the, the whole book of Ephesians is, here we go. And you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. 
And this is talking to the Gentile church. In whom you formerly walked in accordance with the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too as Gentiles formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, wrath, even as the rest. Say the next two words. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love which He has bestowed on us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. In parentheses, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as, not as a result of work or the law, so that no one may boast. For we are all His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called un-Jews, uncircumcised by the so-called Jew circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember this that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope, no hope in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that amazing? For he himself is our peace, not the keeping of the law, who made us both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one, and broke down the barrier and the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh that hostility which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Did you just see that? So that in himself, in Christ himself, dying on the cross for our sins, he might make us the two into one man, thus establishing peace. Thus establishing peace. We are just now going to start into Romans and Ephesians and not one or two verses, entire chapters concerning this very if it interests you please come back if if you're watching over the internet i think it'll come this will come out tomorrow i'm asking you again read tonight i mean i hope that you're aggravated at me enough to go home and just in anger even read romans 7 and 8 and you'll just keep reading because it'll get you interested real quick all right let's bow for a word of prayer Lord Jesus, as we just continue this series that started three weeks ago, may you show us your light, your glory, your salvation, your cross, your resurrection, your ascension, your giving of our Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, such comfort, and, and, that, and that guiding voice, that north star that guides us to do something, either make a negative or a positive decision. And Father, when we gather together on Sunday morning, May we not be heavy and downtrodden, but because we are a Gentile congregation, may we of all people observe joy and peace and fellowship and unity when we gather together as the church in peace. Holy Spirit, guide hearts today. Bring us to the truth that maybe we're just a bunch of legalists trying to keep the rules, never understanding that you have such a bigger plan for us and our lives. It is in the name of Yeshua ben Nostra, Jesus of Nazareth, that we pray and praise these things. Amen. Let's all stand for our final blessing this morning, which I've changed about eight times on my notes. Now, you'll love this. Does any, I, I'm not going to ask. Just go home and read it. Well, because you'll know a lot about next week if you do. I'm challenging you. You'll go, oh, I know exactly where he's going. Okay. And then the week after that, I'm going to give you another chapter to read. Okay. Ready to read this? Let's read it like fired up Gentiles. Ready? Now. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons and daughters. God bless the Lord. I'll see you Wednesday night. I'll see you Wednesday night.